Hi, Simon Morrow here. I'm putting together a quick video for one of the members of the Panorama Mixing and Mastering Community Facebook group. Um, it's uh, the, or the intention of this video is to demystify compression a little bit. There's a lot of misinformation out on the web and also out of context um, information. So I just want to start with um, an overview of what compression is and why we have it. Compression is a way that we can, or the use of compression with a compressor, is a way that we can reduce the dynamic range of program material. So what it essentially does is attenuate louder parts of the signal to squish, compress, reduce the dynamic range. So why do we need this? Um, well, if you think about the dynamic range of a symphony orchestra versus the dynamic range of vinyl, or the dynamic range of a vocalist versus the dynamic range of a CD, we have a problem here. And that is that the, the sound we are trying to record has a much greater dynamic range than the medium of which we're trying to record it to. Okay, so how do you fit this much dynamic range onto this much dynamic range? Um, so one, one way we could do it is um, if we look at the, the sound or the, the dynamic range, which is uh, on your left, um, we can see that the, the top bit, the loud bit is crossed out, which is all distorted. So that's one option. We could just distort the loud parts and that will fit on the smaller dynamic range. Um, not ideal. Another option would be that we turn everything down and then we can see the bottom um, on the left hand side it's crossed out so that's that's the quiet part of the signal and now that's lost in noise or inaudible so that's another option but it's not ideal um, so the third option is you know we could go somewhere in the middle turn some of the loud stuff down so we we lose less of the um, less of the quiet stuff is brought up and we distort less of the top stuff, but we still got distortion and we're still missing sound. So that, that is also not ideal. What we want to do is reduce the dynamic range of the loud signal to then fit it on the recording medium, which is the, the lesser dynamic range. So does that make sense? We're going to use compression to reduce the dynamic range to fit the destination. Now that could be a CD, it could be vinyl, it could also be the dynamic range of a PA at a live system, it could be the dynamic range used for broadcast. Okay, so a compre compressor is used to control the dynamic range for whatever reason we, the operator, choose. So that's the other thing to remember here is that all of this um, audio equipment and plugins is designed to facilitate what us, the operators, are trying to achieve and not the other way around. Okay, so compression attenuates loud signal, reducing the dynamic range to fit the destination. Um, of course we can use compression in creative ways and I get really excited about doing that, but I wanted to give you an understanding of why compression was invented. Okay, so now what is compression? Compression is automatic gain control. It's automatically going to attenuate the signals um, the, the program material once it triggers the compressor by going in above the threshold. Okay, so if we really want to simplify a compressor, we could consider it to be this, a fader. A compressor in bypass mode or with a signal below the threshold is your fader at unity. The same level comes in, same level comes out. When the signal goes above the threshold, or in some cases approaches a threshold, the fader attenuates the signal at a speed and to a, an attenuation level according to the other parameters. When the signal drops back below the threshold, the fader, according to the other parameters, is then moved back to unity. Okay, so we are attenuating signal when the signal goes above the threshold. Um, I want to quickly explain attack and release because there is um, there is a, a big misconception about attack and release. Um, the misconception is that attack is the time the compressor waits before clamping down on the signal. So the, the, the idea or some people teach that the signal goes above the threshold, 
then the compressor kind of waits for 10 milliseconds, then it compresses. That's absolutely false. What happens is, as the signal triggers by going above the threshold or even approaches the threshold, depending on your other parameters, such as knee, that attack time is more like the speed at which that fader is brought down, okay? And the same with release. It's not that the compressor waits for 100 milliseconds, then instantly jumps back to unity, bypass mode. No, that release time is once the signal goes back above the threshold, it's kind of like the speed the engineer brings the fader back to unity where the compressor is in bypass mode. So does that make sense? We have our attack, which is the speed of attenuation, kind of, and then we have release, which is the speed at which the fader is brought back to unity. And that's how we can get those creative pumping and breathing effects. Um, so if, if uh, attack and release were periods of waiting before going in and out of compression, we wouldn't be able to get that pumping and breathing um, and um, compression would be very, um, very audible and, and kind of, it wouldn't work in the, in the same way we use it today. So what, let, let's just recap so far. Threshold is essentially the, the level at which the, the, when the program material goes above it, the compressor will start doing its thing according to the other parameters. The uh, attack is the speed at which that fader is brought down to the attenuation level, kind of about two thirds of the way down, um, releases the speed at which it's brought back uh, to unity. So hopefully just those three pieces of information will help you understand compression a little bit more. So um, what have we got next? Um, our ratio. So our ratio is expressed in X to one. Um, I think of X as a cost per decibel. So um, I'll just get one of my diagrams. So here we can see a compression ratio of one to one, minus 15, minus 10, minus five. And we can see that for every one dB above the threshold that the signal goes, we get one dB out. So here we are, five dB above, and we've got five dB out. Now, if I were to change that ratio to five to one, it actually costs five decibels to get one decibel out. So if, if we switch that same compressor in the same scenario to five to one, where previously we had five decibels out, now we're getting, oh sorry, minus five. Um, so we've gone from minus 10 to minus five, which is five decibels. Um, here we've got minus nine because we've got one decibel for every five decibels that go above the threshold. So kind of like imagine a, a vending machine and, a, and you know, for every, the, the X is the cost per decibel. So you've got to put five decibels in to get one decibel out or 10 decibels into the machine to get two decibels out at five to one. Um, so, um, you know, the, the higher the ratio, the more compression you're going to get if all of the other um, parameters are the same. Because remember, you can have a two to one ratio and a low threshold and get a lot more attenuation than a 10 to one ratio and a high threshold. Um, so, you know, it's not just the, the amount of attenuation, um, but it is how many dB go in above the threshold to get one dB out. Um, that's what your ratio is. Um, so the, the, you know, the good news is that I, as I mentioned, um, you know, I'll rarely be thinking about, you know, what is my ratio? I'm just listening to it and looking at my meters and if it feels good and sounds good, then it's right. Um, something you might want to consider is that um, a ratio of 10 to one and above is considered limiting. Uh, of course you will actually, you know, it's not a brick wall limiter. And in fact, brick wall limiters still go over the, um, go over the, the threshold and uh, particularly with, um, true peaks. So anyway, broad brush strokes. <coughs> so what else? Um, let's look at our knee. Um, again, I'm speaking sort of simplistically, our knee is the linearity 
of the compression curve. Um, so here is a hard knee, which is very, very linear. So the signal goes into the threshold, or above the threshold, and then flat line, very linear. And the compression begins, or the attenuation compression starts to happen much closer to the threshold. If we were to switch to a soft knee setting, we can see that it's actually more logarithmic um, and the compression is actually starting to happen under or beneath the threshold. Um, so hard knee, more linear compression curve, soft knee is more logarithmic. What do you need to know to make your creative decisions? It's kind of simple. A soft knee is going to give you a more transparent compression. A hard knee is going to give you a more obvious compression. So if you're trying to create a pumping and breathing effect with that kind of you know synth being ducked by the kick drum, then you want to use a hard knee because you want the compression to be obvious. But if you're using a compressor to um, tame a vocal or an orchestral recording, you want the compression to be transparent. You want it to be functioning sort of purely as that, I need this dynamic range to fit on here, but still sound like this, then you want a more transparent compression. Uh, so a soft knee is going to be probably more suitable to that application. Um, so I guess that brings me to my next point, which is, um, and, and this can be applied to any piece of audio equipment, um, plug-in hardware, um, it's all so much easier to use when you know why you're using it. So I remember when I first started engineering, I would put a compressor on a vocal and fiddle with the settings without knowing, you know, I just heard you've meant to put a compressor on it. Uh, now I put six compressors on my vocal in parallel. Um, but, but anyway, the point being is that acting without purpose makes it very confusing. So now if I'm reaching for a compressor or an EQ or a reverb or a slap echo, um, the reason why I'm doing that, it, it all starts for me with a, recog a recognition of a desire to change the sound. So my process might be, uh, I'm listening to the bass, I think I want to do something to that bass. What do I want to do? And I'm listening and maybe the bass playing is very inconsistent. So some of the notes are unintentionally louder than others. So now I've recognized a desire to change the dynamics of the bass. I know what I'm trying to do is to even out those unintentional loud notes. So now I have a purpose for reaching for a compressor because a compressor is an ideal tool to correct that problem. So now when I load up my compressor and I'm going to choose a compressor that is suited to that job and you know that that's what takes time to you know to learn which compressors do certain things particularly well um, but anyway now that I know I want to use a compressor to even out the the bass um, the the notes that are sort of poking out now when I'm setting my parameters I have a, a goal and a purpose and a reason so it's going to be a lot easier to set it up whereas if I just throw a compressor on there and have no reason for it to be there, of course it's going to be confusing for me because I have no goal, I have no reason to have it there. Um, so I think that can really, really help you um, when you're reaching for these tools. If, if there's no specific reason to put something on there, then just leave it off, okay? Um, if you have a purpose for putting it on there, then, then all of your decision-making around your parameters can be um, linked back to that goal. So, you know, I want to even out those loud bass notes. Well, I'm going to want the attack to be kind of quick because I want to pull those bass notes down kind of quickly. And, you know, I'm going to want, I'm going to want the, um, the release time to at least hold the compressor for the duration of the, the notes. Otherwise, it's going to duck and then sort of go back up uh, uh, to, you know, louder than I want it to, to be um, when it's decaying. Um, so... Hopefully that kind of helps just with thoughts around sort of setting up. Um, so maybe I'll just recap again. Compressors were designed to reduce the dynamic range of program material to fit another medium. So whether it's, you know, the dynamic range of a PA or the dynamic range of vinyl. Compression is 
automatic gain control. It is attenuating signal. We have our threshold, which is the, the level at which when the signal goes above that threshold or approaches, the compression will start happening. That gain reduction will start happening. The attack is kind of the, um, where's, my, where's my little fader? Um, the attack is kind of the speed at which that fader, that gain reduction, that volume is attenuated. The release is the speed at which that fader is brought, brought back up to unity. Um, the knee is the linearity of that compression curve. Hard knee for more obvious compression. Uh, soft knee for more transparent compression. Our ratio x to 1 is how many dB above the threshold have to go into the compressor to get 1 dB out of the compressor. If it's 2 to 1, you've got to put 2 dB in above the threshold to get 1 out. If it's 2 to 1 and you put 4 dB in above the compressor, you'll get 2 dB out. Um, does that make sense? Um, so what else? What about um, our makeup gain? So when we... Um, uh, so often people talk about how compression makes things sort of fatter and louder. Um, so it doesn't make things louder. It actually attenuates them. So we reduce the dynamic range. Then when we use the makeup gain to bring the peak level back up to where it was, it has that perception of making everything louder because it's actually, you know, the brought the noise, noise floor up if you consider the relationship between the loud and the soft before. So uncompressed, there might be 20 dBs different between the loud and the quiet. After compression, there might be 10 dB difference, so it sounds louder. Uh, and that's also how we get things to sound fatter. So to, you know, make your kick drum and snare drum sound fatter, You've got the transient up here, and you've got the body down here, and when we reduce the dynamic range of that kick drum or snare, then the, the, the relationship between the peak and the body is reduced, so we perceive it as being fatter because all of that resonance in the decay of the drum is now much closer to the, the volume of the, of, the, um, of the transient. So that's how we can sort of get that fatness. Um, what else? Have I covered everything? Um, I think so. I might, um, I might even attach another video that I made a while back um, just with some examples of the attack and release actually um, occurring so you can hear how it works. Okay, anyway, I hope you uh, found that um, helpful and hopefully it's demystified compression and compressors a little bit for you. Uh, feel free to ask me any questions. Um, comments, uh, I will respond ASAP. Thanks. Here's a quick video to show how the attack on a compressor actually works. So I have a compressor set up here. I have a signal generator generating pink noise. That'll be our sound source. We can listen to it now. And I'm also going to key the side chain of the compressor with another signal generator. So let's listen to the signal and when I unmute the key it will trigger the compressor and we can hear how the compressor actually begins attenuating immediately and that the attack is the speed at which the compressor takes to reach complete attenuation of the signal based on the other settings. I'll do that again. You can see it begins immediately. If we have a soft knee, compression actually can begin to occur below the threshold. Um, and while I've got this open, let's look at how the release time is the time that it takes the compression to go back to unity gain. So the equivalent of moving a fader back up to unity. If we increase the release time, we can see that is clearly the speed at which the compression goes back into uh, unity gain. I'll make the release faster. Make the attack faster. So 
So there you have it. Attack is actually the speed at which the attenuation occurs rather than the time the compressor waits before compressing. Now, why this is important is that if you assume that attack is a period of time the compressor waits before engaging, that implies that you, the engineer, have no control over the attenuation curve and that it would be instantaneous. Because the attack is actually the speed at which the attenuation occurs, it gives you much more control over the envelope of the sound for both the attack and release. I'll do a quick demonstration of what would happen if the attenuation was actually a wait period rather than a duration. I'll demonstrate that by just using um, some automation here. Um, so if, if it happened instantaneously, we would trigger the threshold, then we would wait the period of time, and then the attenuation would be instant. Like that. But clearly, from the demonstration I gave earlier, you can see that the attack is actually the speed at which that fader, as an example, the fader comes down to reach the uh, full compression uh, attenuation. I hope that helps.